So, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Janice Harris, and I am the Assistant Director of Environmental Resource Policy in DARA. And part of my remit is extended producer responsibility, which is what we're here talking about today. We're covering quite a lot of policy areas this morning, so we've got quite a big panel. Uh, we have Amy Scott for packaging, Robert McLaughlin for a deposit return scheme, Kitty Harvey for batteries, Stephen Clegg for we textiles and tobacco, Charmian Beer on coffee pods and chewing gum, and Leslie Roberts and Aideen McChesney will also be joining us for our Q&A sessions. And I shouldn't forget our webinar host for today, that's Catherine O'Hara from the EPR team. Next slide, please, Catherine. So here we have this morning's agenda. The session will run for about an hour and a half, and we have left plenty of time for your questions. Are we two two Q and A slots? As I said, we're covering quite a lot of topics today: packaging, deposit return, batteries, tobacco, textiles, we chewing gum and coffee pods. And you ask for for this at our last um, webinar in this series. So hopefully we have something of interest for everyone attending. Just a quick word on domestics then, um, please be advised that this webinar will be recorded today. The recording will be made available on our EPR webpage following this event. Due to data protection, you, the external participants, will not be visible or audible and no personal details will be recorded. Should you have a question at any point throughout the session, please feel free to ask it via the Q&A panel on the right hand side of your screen by directing your question to all panelists. Due to data protection, your name and question will be visible to yourself and panelists only. Obviously, we'll try to answer all questions during this webinar, but if there are any that we can't get to or we don't know the answer offhand, we'll post answers on our EPR webpage after the event. Next slide, please, Catherine. Um, so to kick things off today, uh, we have a poll question which asks how much more would you be willing to pay for more sustainable packaging? Um, this question ties into our first update for the day. So while you're answering that, I'll just take the opportunity to introduce our first speaker, Amy Scott. Um, Amy works in our packaging EPR team here in Dara. Um, there has been quite a lot of outward comms over the last couple of months to prepare everyone involved in the upcoming changes in the packaging sector. Um, but we know that uh, the last webinar for this wider uh, audience was in September, um, and there's been quite a lot of progress made since then. So Amy is going to share updates on the, the, the design uh, of the packaging EPR scheme and also some key dates to look out for. So, Stephen, um, you've been managing the poll for us there. Um, hopefully, you have the results in. Certainly, almost half the room went with a, a little more, Janice. A, a mixed response to A and C, but certainly almost half the room for for B. Fabulous. You know the fact, the fact that people are willing to pay a little bit more does reflect a general trend seen in global markets and, and that's that's great uh, great to hear thanks very much Stephen so now as I said we, we'll we'll move on to Amy's presentation next slide please Catherine brilliant uh, thank you Janice for the introduction and hello everybody um, as mentioned I work on the policy team for packaging EPR so this morning I'll be giving an update on the changes expected to come with the introduction of the EPR for packaging scheme, which is being undertaken throughout the UK. Um, at the last Tackling Problem Waste Streams webinar, which I'm sure many of you attended, we had a bit of background on the need for these changes and heard a review of the 2021 consultation government response. So I'll not be going over the same things, but will provide an update of where we are now, six months later. I'll also remind you of the new legislation being brought in and offer a view of what packaging EPR will practically look like over the next couple of years, from producer fees down to the new labelling we can expect to see on shop shelves as consumers. So next slide, please, Catherine. <coughs> Thank you. So just a quick bit of background first to give a bit of context. Um, when put into practice, the well-known polluter pays principle is used to ensure that those who produce pollution bear the full costs of managing it. Um, and the goal there is to prevent unintended harm to human health or the environment. 
and extended producer responsibility is a policy instrument that follows this principle um, and in our case in packaging sees the responsibility for the full life cycle of packaging materials placed on those businesses that put the material on the market and in a nutshell obligated companies will be required to enable the recycling of used packaging by making payments to cover waste services um, including collection and disposal of materials and consultations took place in 2019 and 2021 um, and the government response was published in March 2022 and all of those are available online. Extensive stakeholder engagement on the scheme design continues as we progress through implementation phases now. Um, and just to make you aware that in the scope of the first phase, producers will be covering the cost of packaging in household waste only. So that's not including business waste currently. EPR for packaging will be run by a scheme administrator who will calculate council payments and invoice producer fees. And I'll go into a bit more detail about this on a later slide. Next, please, Catherine. So this is really being brought about by um, new legislation coming in. And this comprises of a new UK wide statutory instrument, which will revoke the 2007 packaging waste regulations, both for GB and Northern Ireland, and will bring in the new requirements with it. But before that, we have a new data reporting statutory rule, which will require producers to collate packaging data preceding the EPR coming into operation, which is essentially this year. Um, so these regulations will be for Northern Ireland, but will mirror the rest of those in uh, the rest of the UK. On the 7th of February um, this month, we held a technical webinar for packaging producers in Northern Ireland, just to get into a bit more of the detail of what data needs to be collected and reported. And if you missed this or you'd be interested in hearing a bit more um, about the detail, please uh, look it up on our DARA YouTube channel or our DARA EPR webpage. Um, there's a recording available there. So as well as these, uh, England, Scotland and Wales will be amending their current regulations on material facilities to include the new sampling and compositional requirements under EPR for packaging. Northern Ireland doesn't currently have equivalent regulations, so new legislation will be um, introduced to ensure uniformity across the UK. But uh, there are steps being taken to support this change and Northern Irish waste management businesses should be given a bit of a lead in time. There are stakeholder engagement sessions already um, having been held with existing and newly in scope businesses and guidance is being developed. And we've just popped the um, EPR team email on the screen there. It'll be on further slides, I'm sure, but that's just in case you would like to contact us regarding the material facilities regulations. And I'd just like to say at this point in my presentation, um, we've got to this point today because packaging was one of the waste streams prioritised by the previous Minister for DARA, for which EPR was to be considered. Um, for clarity, the legislation shown on this slide will still be made and can still be made in the absence of a Northern Ireland executive. Um, so next slide, please. This uh, timeline just shows what you can expect over the next couple of years as packaging EPR is phased in. So I'm just going to run through this quite quickly and then go into the detail of each of the key stages in later slides. So from next month, producers will be required to collate packaging data in line with the new data reporting regulations. And then at the beginning of next year, the scheme administrator will be appointed and the main statutory instrument will come into force in 2024 as well. Um, modulated fees will be introduced from 2025 and the new sampling regulations for material facilities introduced in the same year. The next slide, please. Um, there's more happening in 2025. We'll also introduce a mandatory take back requirement for fibre based composite cups under EPR. And following this, recycling targets for fibre based composite packaging may be introduced. And finally, all packaging types, including plastic films and flexibles, will be required to be labelled as recycle or do not recycle by the 31st of March 2027, at which point we expect plastic films to be um, able to be collected from the curbside alongside core packaging materials. Next slide, please. So the first step, um, fast approaching, is the requirement for obligated producers to report packaging data. 
Uh, as I said, we gave this technical webinar on the 7th of February to Northern Ireland packaging producers um, with a lot more detail. But an overview is this. Organisations that handle and supply packaging and packaged goods could be affected by EPR for packaging. Um, those affected have been asked to start collecting the data from the 1st of January this year, but it won't be mandatory until March. There is now an online obligation checker tool that went up at the end of December um, that can be used to find out if the regulations apply to you and what you need to do next to comply. Um, just a reminder, you don't need to report packaging data if you're a charity or a non-UK organisation that doesn't operate in the UK. Um, being classed as a large producer, you have an annual turnover of two billion pounds or more, and you're responsible for handling and supplying more than 50 tonnes of empty packaging or packaged goods in the UK. And the reason that these categories exist is because large uh, producers will be asked to report this data twice a year, starting between July um, and October 2023. And a small producer, which is um, a producer with annual turnover over one million pounds or placing over 25 tonnes of packaging on the market, will only be asked to report data once a year um, between January and April 2024. Next slide, please. So you may also um, have to report data about which country in the UK the packaging you supplied to a consumer has been sold, hired, loaned. Um, or is discarded in and becomes waste in. And this is nation data. Um, but again, check out uh, the recent webinars and, and guidance online if you are a packaging producer or a brand owner. Next slide, please. So, um, as you'll be aware, a scheme administrator will be appointed as a public body to manage packaging EPR. And the main statutory instrument coming into place in 2024 will give powers to the scheme administrator to invoice producers and make payments to councils to cover the full life cycle of household packaging waste in the first few years. Your data collected in 2023 will determine producer obligations for 2024. And we've got a lovely diagram on the slide here. So um, at A in the picture, you can see that this is where uh, the producer data um, of packaging placed on the market feeds into this overall fees and payments calculator um, that's used to um, share out the invoices and payments. Um, at B there in the picture, uh, we gather cost data from councils and waste management companies. And this is only the cost of handling packaging in scope, not all waste. Um, but that is uh, ongoing at the minute. Um, and obligated large producers will be liable for packaging waste management fees from April 2024. We expect that the fees will be calculated through this um, model during the first quarter of the financial year. And then shown by C, the outputs that come out then are that producers will be notified of their liabilities with invoicing due later in the year. And councils will also receive um, early notification of payments due throughout the year as well. So this is definitely a simplified version of the way the scheme administrator will calculate payments, um, but the model continues to be developed by teams in DEFRA with input from all four nations. As mentioned, this is all for household packaging for now. And just to note, PRNs and PERNs will continue during the first phase of packaging EPR as a viable interim solution while we develop and review options for payments for business waste. You'll need to submit data as well about the amount of packaging likely to end up in street bend waste, as producers will be obligated to make payments for this in future years. And for example, this might include takeaway boxes, um, confectionery wrappers, and there are lists online of the most um, commonly street bend uh, items, so you can check that out. But that's that for the scheme administrator. So next slide, please. Then just coming to um, fees for producers. So we are aiming to provide an indication of base fees for 2024 payments shortly. I know that's something that um, people are very keen to, to get their hands on and understand. Um, and we'll provide more details on our approach to modulating fees in the summer of 2023. 
Um, the idea of modulating fees is a central part of the design of the scheme, as this is how um, we'll incentivise producers to use less packaging or more easily recyclable packaging to achieve the ultimate aims um, of looking after the environment. So you may have already begun to see changes in the sustainability of packaging on shelves as well. Um, we'll give the scheme time to embed in, but from 2025, modulated fees are planned to be introduced. And these will initially be based on recyclability only. Um, the scheme administrator will be responsible for determining how fees uh, are set. So it's um, all down to the scheme administrator and they'll be in charge of modulating them in line with regulations and for demonstrating that the modulation is achieving the desired policy outcomes. And if they find that it, it isn't or there's more work to be done, modulation will, uh, can be developed over time to include other environmental factors such as carbon, but ultimately that will be for the scheme administrator to consider. So next slide, um, we're just on to an aspect of packaging EPR that's probably more noticeable in your day to day. Um, around 3.2 billion fibre composite cups uh, or coffee cups were placed onto the UK market in 2019 and along with that around 2.9 billion cup lids as well and despite the fact that there's enough recycling capacity to recycle all fibre composite cups um, placed on the market in the UK these uh, materials and this this item achieved a tiny 2.8% um, recycling rate in 2019. So uh, what can extended producer responsibility um, reforms mean for these single-use cups? Well, for now, an EPR approach combined with a mandatory take-back scheme is the chosen policy option for managing single-use cups and on-the-go fibre composite food packaging. Um, and under EPR from 2024, sellers of these cups that employ 10 people or more at full time equivalent will be required to provide a dedicated bin in, in their retail outlet that's visible and easily accessible for consumers to use in disposing of used cups. And sellers will need to accept any used cups um, irrespective of where the cup was purchased to. Those obligated will need to report to the regulators the tonnage they've placed on the market and the tonnage they've collected and sent for recycling. Um, and this is collected for the purposes of understanding the, re the recycling rates and with a view to making targets if needed in the future. Um, just to note as well, where a business joins a take back scheme or a compliance scheme, the data can continue to be reported through the take back scheme to the regulator. Um, we are continuing to work with UK, Welsh and Scottish government bodies to determine the approach to regulating this policy and um, to consider how the role will be funded in the longer term. Um, then we just have a slide on labelling next. Um, this is uh, obviously something that's quite new with being brought in with EPR as well. So um, labelling requirements are going to be introduced through this new main statutory instrument um, coming out uh, later. So labelling must be in place for the majority of packaging materials by the 31st of March 2026 given approximately two and a half years um, of a transition period. But a further year is going to be permitted for the labelling of plastic films and flexibles. Um, so they have until the 31st of March 2027 to align with requirements for local authorities to have the infrastructure for recycling collections in place for these materials. Um, one of the major changes will be in the terminology um, to accompany the logo. So. Um, OK, the image used on the screen here, we have an example of recycle and don't recycle, um, but this will definitely be ruled out as do not recycle. Just for clarity, we didn't have an image to share on that. Um, but that is what is coming in. There's already been a DEFRA newsletter published that gives initial insight into what the guidance um, will say, and that guidance is expected later this year. And the newsletter includes details on the, the labelling of multi-material or component packaging. Um, so keep an eye out for that guidance, which will definitely be shared early enough to give time for the transition to be made. Um, so just the final slide there, Catherine. Yep, brilliant. Um, everything I've gone over today is available in the guidance material or has been shared at one of um, 
the recent forums um, or webinars run by DEFRA. Um, there's currently one forum for producers known as the Business Readiness Forum and one for local authorities as well. And um, I would really encourage you to get involved in this for the latest updates. Um, the one for producers meets fortnightly and the one for local authority authorities meets monthly at the minute. Um, but yeah, overall, the best way I can suggest you keep up with uh, to date is subscribing to the packaging EPR newsletter, which um, also includes some information on material facilities and DRS updates for Northern Ireland. Um, but for anything you've missed up to this point, there are plenty of recorded webinars on both DEFRA and DERA YouTube channels and websites. Um, the link there just in the green at the bottom of the slide is for the newsletter. So they're um, not published on a frequent basis, but come out whenever there are any updates to share. Um, so that is it for me. I just encourage you yeah, to keep keep in touch with us. Um, if you have any questions, um, feel free to ask them today in our Q&A session as well. Thank you. Back to you, Janice. Thank you, Amy. Really a lot of information there. So very helpful indeed for people. Um, so, uh, give people, we'll give people a wee chance to pause there before we go into another media session on deposit return scheme. So, again, um, a, a poll question for you. Uh, we'd like to know what you think about the bin binary labeling, the recycle, do not recycle labels, and, and, and if you would submit your answers, we'd be very grateful indeed. Um, while we are waiting for the results, um, um, just to remind you that the slides and recording will be made available and um, also please do look at the additional recorded webinars and the guidance that we've pointed at too. It's all very helpful, all designed there to help you. Um, all packaging producers um, are receiving email updates, newsletters and invitations to events from us. So if you aren't on our list and think you should please do, please do email us. Um, next up, we'll have Robert McLaughlin with an update on deposit return scheme. Um, but before we do that, Stephen, um, could you give us the results of the poll? Yes, absolutely. Unanimously, uh, yes. Over 99% of the people that responded uh, have went with yes. Magic. Thank you very much, Stephen. That's really good. Thank you. Okay, the next slide, please, Catherine. Over to you, Robert. Thanks, Janice, uh, and welcome everyone uh, to today's webinar. Um, as Janice mentioned, I'm going to talk through deposit return scheme um, that will be introduced in Northern Ireland, England and Wales for single use drinks containers. A deposit return scheme or DRS is a producer responsibility scheme designed for a very specific material stream. Introducing a DRS is a joint policy programme across England, Wales and Northern Ireland. The scheme is due to go live on October 1st, 2025. Uh, Scotland have developed a separate scheme due to go live on the 16th of August 2023. For any of the stakeholders that place uh, drinks on the market in Ireland, their scheme will go live on the 1st of February 2024. And currently there's a producer and retailer registration for the scheme open, which will close at the end of March 2023. You can find the details of this on Return's website. Uh, so just a reminder to anybody that needs to register on that prior to um, the scheme next year. So as most of you will know, there have been two consultations on DRS in England, Wales and Northern Ireland, one in 2019 and one in 2021. The 2021 consultation received 2,590 total responses and 83% of those respondents expressed support for DRS. Get the next slide, please, Catherine. So deposit return schemes are tried and tested and are being used around the world to achieve high recycling rates such as 96% in Germany. Many more nations are reducing DRS to, make, to meet their higher recycling targets and get segregated material of high quality to be made back in the bottles, which our curbside collections currently don't achieve. DRS promotes a more circular economy. It provides a local source of high quality material for production and removes the need to import recycled material. What producers need back is clean, segregated material to enable bottle-to-bottle -bottle recycling, increase the amount of recycled PET available to remake bottles, uh, and as a result, reduce virgin materials, which when, when manufactured bottles uh, is more carbon intensive. 
a small proportion of DRS containers will continue to remain in council waste streams, uh, and such as curbside collections, where a consumer decides to forgo their deposit. The councils and where relevant waste operators can participate in DRS by separating out the containers and redeeming the deposit on them. This was option one set out in the consultation. Next slide, please, Catherine. So in this slide, you'll see the highlights from the government response, which I'll share further detail in, com in the coming slides. The regulations will be brought forward in England and Northern Ireland in a joint statutory instrument, and Wales will bring forward a separate regulations in parallel through their Senate. Next slide, please, Catherine. So on this slide, we're going to talk about the scope. So the materials and scope of DRS are PET bottles, cans made of steel and aluminium up to from 50 ml to 3 litres. Glass bottles will not be included initially in Northern Ireland DRS, but will keep this position under review. Glass drinks bottles will be obligated under EPR for packaging. Refill containers will also be excluded, as will HDB plastic, as 81% of these are used for milk. Takeaway coffee cups will not be included in DRS, as Amy's previously mentioned, um, and any other materials not mentioned above will be covered by EPR. So labelling. Labelling was overwhelmingly supported, and 95%, in fact, in the consultation for introducing some sort of mandatory label. Um, that will be through a DRS logo or similar. All three nations intend to mandate the use of a mark to identify a product as part of the DRS, an identification marker such as a, a barcode, QR code, uh, to enable the container to be recognised at a return point. Specific details and design will be determined by the DMO. DRS will have a joint three-nation approach, although the scope in Wales will be slightly different as they'll include glass within their scope. We're in regu regular communication with colleagues in Scotland and Ireland to ensure that we obtain lessons learned from their approach and prevent any, any unintended consequences to business and to the public. Can we get the next slide, please, Catherine? So, as you'll see, this one covers collection targets. A key benefit of the scheme is increasing recycling rates, and we'll be placing ambitious collection targets on the DMO to achieve these. The collection target will be phased in at 70% in year one, 80% in year two, and 90% on year three onwards. The reporting period will be based on a calendar year, the 1st of January to the 31st of December, and monetary penalties will be imposed by, on the DMO by regulators where the DMO fails to meet the collection targets. So ensuring effective compliance and monitoring and enforcement in the scheme uh, is essential for the success it's, it's going to deliver. The regulations will place specific obligations on the scheme participants, such as the producers and retailers, and the DMO. The DMO will undertake the initial monitoring and compliance to ensure businesses are complying with the regulations. The DMO will be able to escalate persistent and major breaches to the regulator, who would be NIEA here in Northern Ireland. We would envisage that the same individual with NIEA who looks after stakeholders for, uh, for DRS would do the same for EPR. Next slide, please, Catherine. So the Deposit Management Organisation. The government response sets out that the Deposit Management Organisation will be appointed to manage the overall operation of the Deposit Return Scheme. DRS will be an industry-led scheme and the DMO will be independent, not-for-profit, private organisation. Its membership will be made up of individual companies or trade associations which represent producers and retailers. Given there will be two legally separate schemes, two separate DMO applications will be required, one for England and Northern Ireland and one for Wales. We are very aware how the island of Ireland operates for the drinks industry, and we are eager that the DMO appointment process fully considers this. Next slide, please, Catherine. So financial flows. There are three main funding streams for DRS. The first is producer fees, then revenue from selling collected material to reprocessors, and unredeemed deposits where containers are not returned into the scheme. We expect fees to be proportionate to the types and volumes of materials and quantity of in-scope containers a producer places on the market. Recognising the potential cost burden on the scheme on small producers, the regulations will require the DMO to take into account the size of producer when setting the fees. The DMO will also be responsible for setting the deposit level 
which can be fixed or variable. The DMO will be responsible for sourcing the finance to fund the setup of costs of the scheme, uh, which will be 100% privately funded. Um, next slide, please, Catherine. So retailers uh, and return points. Retailers selling in scope containers will be required to host a return point where consumers can return an empty container and be given their deposit back subject to some specific exemptions that retailers can apply for. The DMO will be obligated to consider the strategic placement of return points to ensure a sensible geographic spread. An exemption service to operate in a return point will be administered by the DMO to support retailers in seeking an exemption there may uh, where it may not be appropriate for them to take containers back. The two criteria set out in regulations for the exemption will be breach of health and safety and close proximity to another return point. The government response also details examples of reasonable excuses to refuse the return of containers, which include uh, things such as religious and ethical grounds where alcohol alcoholic containers um, are being returned where they're not sold. Retailers will receive a handling fee from the DMO to provide reimbursement for the costs incurred in hosting a return point. This will be set by the DMO and reviewed on a regular basis. We recognise the challenges in setting up a take-back service for online sales and want to continue to work with industry on this, focusing on larger grocery retailers offering a take-back service. Where containers are sold in a closed-loop environment, for example in pubs, hotels, restaurants and cafes, the retailer can opt not to pass the deposit on, avoiding to host a return point on the basis that they will keep the container on site for the collection of the DMO. We are aware Welsh Government continue to host further trials on curbside digital DRS. Many elements of a digital DRS are now in place, such as high-speed printing, smartphone technology, but there's not an off-the-shelf implementation plan, and we're also aware that technology may not be compatible with a lot of smaller retailers' IT systems. We will, however, ensure that legislation future proofs the development of DRS and the DMO will decide the best method to adopt to achieve the quality and quantity required. Next slide, please, Catherine. So this slide shows a brief timeline of, of how we, we plan to roll DRS out over, over the next few years. Um, the regulations will set out the commencement date for DRS of the 1st of October 2025. We continue to work with industry to assess the feasibility of this date as more detail is developed on the implementation phases of the scheme, including as part of the DMO application process. So as you'll see from, from the diagram, there's three phases for delivering DRS. The first phase is the government activity up the DMO appointment, which we're aiming to have the regulations complete by the end of this year, and we'll appoint the DMO with the intention of announcing the appointment in spring 2024. Phase two is a DMO setup where the appoint the appoint um, contractual partners um, and make their decision making, etc. Um, and phase three is a DRS rollout, which is a physical implementation of the infrastructure and collection arrangements. Key part of what we're doing at the minute uh, and post government response is stakeholder engagement, uh, and that's taking place currently. Uh, stakeholders are heavily involved in the SI drafting that's taken place, uh, and the engagement is cutting across all implementation areas. We truly value the participation of all stakeholders, in particular those in Northern Ireland, and those that have already provided and continue to provide uh, input, many of which I'm sure are on the call today. I'd like to thank everybody for taking the time today to attend, uh, and I'll pass you back to Janice. Thanks very much, Robert. Uh, very, as helpful as ever. Um, so, look, we, we're just going to run a, a polling question here because uh, we're going to go to a question and answer session here. So, we have people in the background assigning questions to panelists. So, we'll just give them a moment to do that. There's quite a lot in already. Um, and um, we, we'll, we'll do this polling question first. So, uh, Robert mentioned the maximum deposit level will be specified in legislation, um, and we'd like your view on what this should be. Um, so, and as I said, we're, we're going to a Q and A next. So, um, you, you can submit questions via the, the Q and A panel on the right hand side of your screen. Um, 
So, uh, Stephen, I believe the poll has finished there. Um, would you like to give us the results of the poll? It has indeed, yes. Uh, 30 P's actually, A, Janice, is, a, is the majority answer on this occasion. There was still interest for 40 and 50, but 30 is the majority. That's great, thank you. It, Stephen, really useful to get a straw poll in that one as we'll be discussing that further with, with colleagues uh, across the water. Thanks very much indeed. Next slide, please, Catherine. Okay, so um, we, we have a couple of Q&A sessions today. This is the first one. So on our this Q&A panel, we are bringing in Charmaine Beer, who heads up the packaging EPR and DRS teams. Also Robert there on DRS and Leslie, the policy lead on packaging EPR. Um, and as I said, uh, while you were submitting your questions there, Charmaine and Aileen were, were sitting in the background um, assigning uh, panelists questions. Um, so. Um, I, I'll, I'll go to maybe Charmaine first um, and ask you um, what questions you received there. Could you take us through, Charmaine? Yes, certainly. I'll start with questions on the um, fiber-based cup take back because we had quite a few. Um, some of them came in before questions were obviously answered during the presentation. But yes, um, the take back is um, from 2025 and that is UK wide. Um, there was another one there about vending machines in premises and who would have the obligation. Would it be like the cost of machine inside um, a WH Smiths or something like that? The obligation would be with, with the retailer rather than the company running the vending machine. It's at the point of sale um, where that would be. So in those sorts of situations, it would be the retailer. Um, there's a question here about um, how can we ask about sustainable packaging if there's no such thing? <clears throat> Excuse me. Hopefully, Amy covered that over the course of the, her presentation. The focus on this first stage of EPR is looking at the recyclability of packaging rather than sustainability. So the modulation of fees, which Amy talked through, will be based on that. Um, will we be covering um, the um, Packaging, packaging waste regulation in Northern Ireland protocol. We're not covering that in this presentation. Obviously, it's something that we're very aware of. All nations are looking at the European proposals and any implications that might have for Northern Ireland. And for anyone interested, that was published on the 30th of November, that proposed new regulation. But we will be looking at, we are looking at that with all the nations at the moment. Um, I have another one here about um, what are the plans for EPR payments to non-statutory public bodies such as TransLink who embrace their responsibility with regard to litter and plastic pollution and do active campaigns on that? This first stage of, a of um, EPR is absolutely focused on making payments to councils. It won't solve everything and it won't be able to make payments to everybody. It has been looked at, but um, what is going to be covered in this is um, payments for any Packaging disposed of in street bins um, at this stage, and that and those bins that are managed by local councils. Um, there's a comment here. So I'll just keep rolling, Janice, and try and cover these off. Um, there's a comment here just about the scheduling of of stakeholder engagement. Yes, um, obviously we're involved with all the four nations um, on all the stakeholder engagement, um, and some of the scheduling of the meeting is is changing. Some of the people on this call are obviously very involved in this too. But this is a four nation approach. Um, so um, we're just working through what best works to get the best input from stakeholders at, at this point in time. Sometimes webinars are good, sometimes face to face is good. Um, so we, we're doing a mixture of all of that. And in terms of setting up the scheme administrator, yes, we need the um, regulations in place and the scheme administrator will have powers then once that regulation is in place and, and the scheme administrator is set up and rolling in 2024. Um, Question here about DRS labelling. Will it be exclusive to Northern Ireland or would it be the same as England? We wouldn't envisage any need for a different label within the three nations at, at the moment, but we're doing a lot of engagement directly with the with the sector and we'll be doing a lot more on, on that labelling um, issue. There's a lot, there's a lot more to be looked at for that to make sure that we have a good system. Um, what, what have we learned from Scotland? Again, we're in touch directly with the Scottish Government colleagues with Circularity Scotland, the DRS um, administrator, and um, all, all four nations are in very close contact. And also as well, we're, we're talking to all the stakeholders who are impacted by DRS in Scotland as well on a daily basis actually at the moment and learning a lot from that. Um, 
There's a question here about how DRS incentivizes a citizen to do the right thing. Um, and if EPR doesn't do that, well, yeah, there's a real financial lever here for citizens in DRS. Um, and that is why, you know, we had hoped to hit, hit these really high recycling rates. It is a different approach to the general EPR. Um, and um, we, obviously, we're going to be looking closely once these schemes are both up and running at their effectiveness. I think that's about it from me, Janice. Thank you, Charmaine. Maybe, Leslie, if I could turn uh, to you first on any other packaging questions there that you can answer. Yes, um, a couple of questions here. We've been asked what um, mechanisms will be in place to stop the large organisations avoiding full compliance through subsidiary companies who produce the lower brackets of packaging. So there is guidance to this on our JERA website as well, but there are different ways for parent companies and their subsidiaries that they can register to comply for it. And it goes through, they can do it as a whole group. They can do it as individual sub, uh, subsidiaries who have the turnover and the packaging tonnage requirements under APR, or they can do it as a parent company for part of the group as well, where some of their, their um, subsidiaries are under APR and some are not. And just then, that they should register as a parent company for part of the group if some of their subsidiaries don't meet the turnover and tonnage requirements in their own right, but do meet the requirements when they are combined. And um, so that is that one. And then there's another question here about cover and labeling of on printed packaging on. So for distributors really who who supply on filled um, plain packaging, they can um, give details over on the um, recyclability then to the small businesses, and then there is flexibility on how these businesses um, relate that information to the consumers. Thank you, okay. Leslie. That's really helpful. And I, I, we have a couple of minutes left, Robert. If there, there are any specific questions there that you can pick out on DRS, first, there's quite the list there. I don't think we're going to get through them all. No, that, that that's fine, Janice. And a, a lot of them uh, is about obligation and retailers and who's obliged and where where we host our turn points. So just to make it clear, anybody that places a drink on the market will be obliged to be in our, within an in scope container. Will be obliged to be part of DRS. Retailers selling in scope containers will need to register as part of DRS as well. Um, smaller retailers, every. There's no de minimis in DRS, so anybody for our DRS that sells a container will need to register. Where there are an exception, as we've mentioned, on hosting return points, the smaller um, retailers that may not have the capacity for the reasons set out in legislation or exemptions that will be set by the DMO can apply for an exemption where there may be a, a local return point close to them. Um, there's a question there about the practical difficulties with sorting the DRS plastic bottles from non-DRS plastic bottles if, if in council curbside by consumers, and will these items not be covered by EP, packaging EPR? No, any in scope items in DRS will be part of DRS, and the financial incentive on DRS with the 20 pence deposit in Scotland, for example, is a lot more than what's in place um, on the value of the current container. So it, there's a financial incentive there to take those containers out and make a net mechanism to return them to the, um, the DMO. Uh, England and Northern Ireland will be one DMO. Um, there'll be a separate DMO for um, Wales, as mentioned. But again, these will work together. The appointment will be together. Um, and we envisage, and what we're aiming for is one DMO for the three nations to operate across um, across the three nations. There will be communication then with the Scottish DMO um, and again, with the DMO in, in Ireland, who you are currently appointed. Um, so, yeah. There's a question there about the, the targets um, as being the same for DRS recycling targets. So 90% um, collection target will be um, is what we're aiming for in year three. And because they'll be in a closed loop and it will be reprocessed, um, it will be um, it will be recycled then from what's what it's collected back through. Um, 
Digital DRS. So as as mentioned, there's lots of trials still ongoing. Wales are are, are leading the charge on the digital DRS trials. Um, at the at the moment, we've held trials in Whitehead here with some of our our local representatives. Um, initially, when the legislation comes in place, there will be an allowance there if the DMO sees fit for technology. But as we are aware, there's no ready to go um, solution to digital DRS right now. Um, and as, as I mentioned in the presentation, IT systems and smaller retailers don't currently accommodate um, so, some of what the requirements are. So again, regulations will leave it open that for technology developments and, and ways to improve DRS, certainly, but it'll be for the DMO to decide how's best to collect that material through. Um, Janice, I think I've covered a lot of those questions there. If there's anything else that I haven't, I'll have another look. Um, Listen, that's okay. We we'll can, there, there's an awful lot in there, Robert. So we can, um, you can have a look sure when we're doing the next few presentations and we can maybe do a bit of a mop up at the end. There's just a couple of things that has come in there that um, I'd like to mention before we move on. There's one person that's, um, made a few some comments about um sustainability and playing packaging and uh, offered a chat with us so it'd be great if that person could drop um someone in the team a line and we can have a chat with you that would be really helpful for us thank you um there's also um someone has put in that um it was announced that there was a, a one minute silence uh for ukraine uh uk wide um announced for 11 uh 11 o'clock today. Now, um, it, it's up, it's, um, it was announced here in the civil service too, and it's up to us whether um, we do or don't do the silence. Um, I've spoken to panelists and we're happy to continue in the interest of keeping the webinar going rather than having um, one minute um, dead air. But of course, we understand if, if anyone feels strongly about the silence that they, they if they want to log off and log on back on again that's absolutely fine and of course this webinar uh, will be available as a recording afterwards on our web page okay so th that that's at the end of the first q a session um, thank you all for your questions i don't think we got through them all there were um quite the amount of questions come in there um but uh, we'll move on um and uh, ho hopefully pick up some more of them at the end of this session so uh, poll, poll question then for you um, before we move on to um, a session on batteries. Um, so there, there has been a fair bit of publicity about batteries fires recently. Um, so we just out of interest like you to have a stab at what percentage of waste fires are caused by lithium ion batteries. And while you're answering that, I'd like to introduce, introduce our next speaker, Katie Harvey, who will be speaking to you about batteries. Um, so, Amy, do we have the results of the poll? Uh, we do, Janice, and um, thankfully the majority of the people got it correct. So, the correct answer was 48 um, percent, and research from Unomia in 2020 found that these fires um, caused by the batteries cost around 154 million pounds annually as well. Um, so it's quite shocking, really, isn't it? Is indeed, yes, absolutely quite a significant issue there and something we do need to pay attention to as we, we particularly as we reform the regime for batteries. But OK, but so for now, over to you then, Katie. Thank you, Janice, for the kind introduction. Um, so I'm Katie Harvey and I'm just going to give you a bit of an update on the EU and the UK battery policy reforms that are currently underway. Next slide, please, Catherine. So, just to contextualise, the existing uh, EU Batteries Directive dates from 2006 and it established really some common rules for operators based on producer responsibility. However, um, 15 years later, the directive is limited in particular against the increased strategic importance and use uh, of batteries. The UK wide requirements for batteries are set out in two pieces of legislation. Uh, which were transposed from the EU directive, so there's little divergence uh, currently. However, the European Commission uh, has proposed a new batteries regulation, which will undergo a final vote before publication in mid-March uh, this year. And uh, as many of you may know, batteries are listed in Annex 2 of the Northern Ireland Protocol, 
So as it stands in terms of trade, certain provisions of the new EU regulation uh, would apply in NI. Um, of course, negotiations regarding the protocol are ongoing, so we're unable to provide much more um, comment on this at this time. Next slide, please, Catherine. Now, just to summarise uh, some of the main elements of the proposed new EU batteries regulation. So, firstly, all batteries will be required to have a visible QR code and a digital passport associated with this, providing key information such as um, composition and, and capacity. Um, there are minimum percentages of recycled materials stipulated, and that's according to the battery chemistry. Also, carbon footprint calculation will be mandatory for each battery model for its entire life cycle. And lastly, there is a due diligence policy that is being implemented um, to reduce the social and environmental um, risks really just associated with the whole battery and life cycle. Next slide, please, Catherine. And just along with the main elements um, of the new regulation, another key component is the introduction of two new battery categories, uh, the light means of transport category and the electric vehicle category, so just highlighted in red on the slide. And that takes us to a total of five categories, in addition to two new battery subcategories in green, uh, the general use portable batteries and an energy storage system subcategory. So, for example, um, in a battery solar panel uh, system where you can um, you know, sell energy back to the grid. Next slide, please, Catherine. So now, just in terms of extended producer responsibility obligations for battery producers, uh, the new EU regulation proposes that producers shall pay to cover the costs of things like separate collection of waste batteries and their subsequent transport and treatment and recycling, and the costs of carrying out surveys of collected mixed waste and providing information on management of waste batteries as well as any reporting costs. And we know that um, some batteries may be subject to more than one EPR, and so in this case, producers can establish cost sharing mechanisms. And they can also entrust a uh, producer responsibility organisation uh, to carry out their EPR obligations on their behalf if they choose. Next slide, please, Catherine. So just in terms of the timeline for the EU changes, the new batteries regulation is likely to be published and adopted by April this year, 2023. Um, then in line, the current batteries directive will be repealed in two years time, so by April 2025. And entry into force for the EU batteries regulation is planned currently for January 2027. So I hope you find this summary useful. Um, and it's worth noting that obviously there's still an awful lot of work to do and further legislation will be required to set things like the methodology for calculation and verification of carbon footprint, the performance and durability requirements, and collection, recycling, and material recovery targets. So, uh, next slide, please. How does the EU regulation fit in with the UK batteries policy reform? So, as I mentioned earlier, highlighted on the slide, the UK wide requirements for batteries are set out in the above two pieces of legislation, and these have been transposed uh, originally from the EU directive. The ongoing um, UK domestic review is at quite an early stage, but it aims to result in a consultation by the end of 2023. So, we know that considerable reform of infrastructure will be required from production to end of life and it'll be important to consider the changes that the EU battery batteries regulation uh, will make to our own UK scheme. So really the UK consultation is aiming to firstly design a system that supports the collection and treatment of all battery types and exploring the best way to fund this through extended producer responsibility schemes. As well as this, we really want to minimise the number of batteries being disposed of in residual waste. 
um, and that's really the reason behind the high rate of industrial fires from um, batteries being disposed of. Um, so some of the following proposals are under consideration uh, and of course subject to consultation. So first of all, measuring collected batteries. Um, we want to address the overcompensation of the lead acid evidence and then eventually move away from collection targets. In terms of placing on the market and reporting, um, consideration is being given to battery categories and uh, weight stipulations for different battery types, as well as reporting across multiple battery chemistries. In terms of producer take-back batteries um, from the end user at the end of life, we want to ensure that producers meet the cost of treatment for batteries without value at the end of their life. And then lastly, uh, for waste and recycling, uh, it's been considered that costs associated with collection and recycling be met by producers and that producers should introduce and fund curbside collections uh, in the UK. And also um, emphasis is being put on maintaining the current uh, retailer take back network uh, next slide, please, Catherine. So lastly, I really just want to take you through the current timeline that we have available for the UK batteries policy reform. So consultation document uh, workup is really ongoing uh, in 2023. And still early 2023, DEFRA have commissioned uh, a research project to gather quantitative evidence from industry for the batteries reform uh, impact assessment and the survey results from this are anticipated by the end of Q2 this year. Uh, stakeholder workshops will follow early mid-23. Um, so far, the engagement really has been technical and has been with industry and producers. Um, so further UK-wide and NI-specific stakeholder engagement is planned for the autumn. And finally, um, the aim is to launch the UK batteries the form consultation by the end of this calendar year, so by the end of 2023. Um, but of course, this is really subject to resourcing um, as well as the timeliness of the EU regulation. So thank you very much. Um, I will hand back to Janice. Thank you very much, Katie. That's really helpful indeed. Um, so um, we have a bit of a medley of um, updates on various waste streams coming up next. Um, so just um, to give you a break before we go into that, um, another uh, quick poll. And we'd like you to have a stab at this question on cleanup grants for chewing gum. Um, um, basically, um, an area of, of equivalent of how many football pitches was cleaned up in the UK last year using uh, chewing gum task force grants. If you could have a go at that, please, we'd be very grateful. Thank you. While you're doing that, um, I'd like to introduce Stephen Clegg, who will give us an update on tobacco litter, textiles and we. And then also we have Charmaine Beer, who will provide an update on two voluntary EPR schemes, and um, that's chewing, chewing gum and coffee pods. So Amy, um, I believe the results of the poll are in. Yes, they are. And um, most people um, were quite ambitious in uh, in what they answered and were right to be um, because the correct answer was 467. Um, so that is a, a huge area around 2.5 kilometres squared of pavements across the four nations in the UK were cleaned up um, through this scheme, which Charmaine will come on to later. Fabulous. Thank you very much indeed, Amy. Thank you. Thank you. So now over to you, Stephen, for tobacco, litter and textiles. Thanks, Janice. Hi, everyone. Yeah, as Janice says, I'm here to talk to you about waste electricals. But before I do, I want to give you that quick update on potential APR schemes for littered tobacco products and textiles, which were actually mentioned at the, the last webinar. So as I'm sure, as you know, we rely on partnership, uh, working with colleagues in DEFRA and the Scottish and Welsh governments to bring forward EPR regimes because they are so complex and the producers involved have such complex value chains. So while work has commenced in both these streams, along with DEFRA and the other devolved administrations, we've had to prioritise our focus on the larger reforms. 
that are already underway on packaging, DRS, we and batteries, as you've heard today. So we cannot currently divert resources to develop any new schemes. However, we do have some work uh, we, uh, to tackle both tobacco litter and textiles that is already underway. DERA uses a combined approach of legislation, education, awareness and enforcement to tackle the scourge of littering in Northern Ireland, including tobacco litter. Also, the department continues to work with Keep Northern Ireland Beautiful to promote behavioural change and environmental awareness. And we have provided them with £730,000 from the Environment Fund this year to support these activities. You may know the department has also recently increased the maximum fixed penalty notice fine from £80 to £200 for fines issued by our councils for littering and dog fouling offences. For textiles, we contribute to RAP's textile initiatives which aims to engage the majority of the UK fashion and textile organisations in collaborative climate action. Signatories to that initiative, they collaborate on carbon, water and circular textile targets and contribute to discussions around the policy development for textiles across the UK. And in addition to that also, we will continue to gather more evidence and participate in UK wide research for tobacco products and textiles. Okay, we're going to turn our attention now towards waste electricals, or we, as it's more commonly known. Next slide, please. Thanks, Catherine. Again, we at DERA, we're continuing to work alongside DEFRA and the Scottish and Welsh governments on the reform of the UK-wide current producer responsibility system for we. And the aim here is to drive up levels of household collections for reuse and recycling, to improve the retailer and the online seller take-back services, and to introduce some new initiatives to support reuse. The reforms also seek to obligate online marketplaces as producers and to improve wee treatment standards by introducing separate material collection targets, including for critical raw materials. So for we basically, we want to move towards an EPR model as is currently happening on packaging. And you've heard about that earlier today and beyond. We are aiming to launch a public consultation on we this summer. And we would encourage you all to express your views and opinions. Waste electricals are the world's fastest growing waste stream, so the importance of that cannot be underestimated. The consultation document will seek your views on a wide range of proposals, and I have time just to highlight a few today. Firstly, the potential for curbside collection of we. Recycling of we is often deemed to be inconvenient, so we need to make it simpler and we need to make it easier for the public. Too much small wee is still simply being dumped in our bins and ending up in our landfill. In fact, research estimates around 155,000 tonnes of household wee went into our bins last year. Our proposals aim to provide benefits for consumers, making it easier and cheaper for all of us to do the right thing in terms of disposing of our wee. But it'll be good for the economy and the high streets too by ensuring internet sellers pay their fair share to dispose of waste that they did help create. The current system was also designed before the trend truly towards a circular economy. So as a result, there are currently little incentives or obligations in the system for producers to design their products with longevity in mind or to prioritize reuse over recycling. We want the producers and retailers to finance the full and fair net costs for the collection and treatment of the equipment they sell when it becomes waste and to ensure those costs are fairly distributed. Some of these proposals and many more were discussed actually in the first webinar of the series and that remains available to view. I think Amy maybe mentioned that earlier, but it is on our EPR page on the DERA website and I'd encourage you all, if you missed that, uh, certainly in relation to we, feel free to avail of that resource. Uh, next slide please, Catherine. Okay, for those of you that aren't aware, Material Focus, formerly known as the WE Fund, is a not-for-profit organisation funded through the producer compliance fees. Some of you may already be aware of HypnoCat, very distinguishable, who's front and centre of their award-winning Recycle Your Electricals UK campaign. And he aims to prevent electricals from being hoarded and thrown away, ensuring instead they're reused and recycled. Material Focus held an online session for our Northern Ireland Councils about mid-January to discuss how they could benefit from the newly launched 2.5 million electricals recycling fund. And I'm glad to say that was attended by most, if not all, of our councils. The 2023 electrical recycling fund covered two types of projects. Firstly, those seeking to add household electricals to collection services using their existing infrastructure, 
and those seeking to innovate new methods for recycling small household electricals. I should say that all information that was discussed regarding the Electricals Recycling Fund session can be found on the Material Focus website. And for those who were unable to attend, a copy of the slides that was presented can also be shared. Just drop me an email at the EPR team, Dara, and that address. I think I'll come up again at the end. I'll be happy to share those, those slides with you. Applications to that particular fund are now closed, and I trust some of you completed the expression of interest form uh, before the 30th of January deadline. And if you did, uh, good luck in that process. It is worth noting, Material Focus recently supported Gloucester City Council who were able to expand their electrical recycling services dramatically, and it actually resulted in a 75% uplift in the tonnage of electricals collected from the curbside, massive, compared with the same period the year before. I was advised that most of our councils are now registered with Material Focus, but if you still haven't done that and you haven't created your account, two minutes will do it, very much worth doing. It means you can access the most recent insights and research, including research into the disposable single-use vapes and battery fires. On top of that, you can access a wide range of online communication toolkits, uh, campaign assets, social media images, editable posters, which are very useful, press ads, media releases, many, many more things I don't have time to mention today, so it's worth getting on there. And just being registered to the newsletter means you'll be advised directly, if not just the annual recycling refund that I mentioned, but you'll also receive information on lots of other initiatives and funds as they introduce them too. And I know Material Focus are keen to see future applications from registered organisations, such as local authorities, non-profits, community sector organisations, PCSs, retailers, and again, I could go on. But thanks for listening. That was just a, a quick overview for we, and I will of course, discuss we further with you in much, much more detail in future webinars after the we consultation launches and the timeline is better established. So I'll speak to you all then a little bit more. Thank you. I'm going to now hand over to Charmaine Beer for our final presentation. Thank you, Stephen. Next slide, please. Thanks. Um, so at the last one, webinar, we told everybody about a voluntary producer responsibility scheme for chewing gum which is fully funded by the major um, producers of chewing gum in the UK market, and it's administered by Keep Britain Tidy for all the four nations. Um, the scheme means that the producers are paying not only to help clean up towns and cities from gum litter, but also take, um, take an action to prevent people littering in the first place by using signage and critically trying to um, change behaviour. So we're pleased to give you all an update as this first year is just closing and we gear up for year two being launched. So next slide, please. So for 2022, um, we were really pleased um, that each council in Northern Ireland was eligible to bid for up to £20,000 and seven councils in Northern Ireland went for that and were all successful in receiving their grants. So there was a total awarded to Northern Ireland um, of 139 thousand pounds. The grants were awarded in August of last year and this, the street cleansing work was wound up um, by around October. There are a few delays in some areas, but um, from what we hear, everything is now is, is now closed off. And the first year report is has been published and is available on that tackling gum littering website that you can see on the slide. So within this fund, um, another plus for Northern Ireland is that we get an allocation of up to 10% of the UK fund, which is the same as what Scotland and Wales get. And that is obviously significantly higher than our sort of 3% by population head. So it means that the money here can be really, really um, useful and um, good work can be done. So it's used for signage, purchasing equipment and for street cleansing. And all of the seven councils who signed up um, received the signage as well. That's the lamppost signs. Um, and stickers on bins and things that you can see on the slide. And these are the real levers then for changing consumer behavior. Next slide, please, Catherine. So um, there's just a brief extract from the closeout report that you can read online. Um, and that's from Fermanagh and Oma District Council, who've got there a visual picture there of the improvement that they were able to undertake um, by using the money that they, um, they received through this grant before and after street cleansing. Next slide, please, Catherine. And other outcomes are four of the councils, Birmingham, Newport, Glasgow and Belfast here in Northern Ireland also benefited from a full independent evaluation of the effectiveness of the cleanup 
and the signage um, that was used for prevention. And that's really important to both producers and ourselves as well, as we want to understand what methods are most effective. So the fund isn't just about getting the work done, it's about understanding and learning the best tactics and also how best to alter the behaviour of the public who continue to litter gum, of which there appears to be still plenty. Um, so there was up to 80% reduction in gum littering in the areas targeted for intervention. And as you can see from this slide as well, 100% of the councils felt that their project had benefited the local community and also had 100% had raised awareness of the issuing um, of the issue of gum littering. So there's a lot more information on the Tackling Gum Litter website, so please do look that up if you're interested. And now really for 2023, the fund has now opened again and our local councils can apply for up to £25,000 each this year. And we really would encourage our councils to avail of this. You can apply again, even if you applied last year. We've circulated information to all of the councils and there's further information at Keep Britain Tidy, the Chewing Gum Task Force page. And you can find out a lot more about the fund and the read the report. Keep Britain Tidy is also hosting a webinar on Tuesday, the 28th of February at 11 a.m. for any councils interested. And that's about what the task force has achieved and also how to apply for a grant. They ran something similar about how to apply for the grants last year, and that seemed to be very useful to people. So we'd strongly encourage interested councils um, to register. So the applications for year two for this year will close on the 25th of March 2023. Decisions would be announced by the end of May. And again, that allows the work to be undertaken during the summer months. Next slide, please. And the other voluntary scheme I want to talk to people about today um, is the scheme called Podback. And it's a not-for-profit coffee and tea pod recycling service. And it's been created in partnership with some of the major names in the coffee pod systems, um, Nescafe, Nespresso, Tazimo. So obviously these machines and pods are becoming much more popular. And as a result of that, they're becoming an ever increasing problem of a waste stream. And within the UK, about 5.3 million households are estimated to now own a coffee pod machine. And about more, about um, 2 billion pods are sold in the UK each year, which is a staggering amount. So while they might seem quite small in tonnage compared to some of the other materials that we're dealing with, they're an ever increasing problem. So Podback works by households signing up for the service through the Podback website. They're sent a supply of material specific recycling bags, and that depends on the brand of machine that you're using. And then you return those pods through a Yodel drop off point, and there's a good network of those across Northern Ireland. The pods are then reprocessed within the UK and that recovers the plastic, aluminium and coffee and all those materials are given a second life. So those plastic components can be manufactured into a range of products, including industrial packaging and furniture. The aluminium, as many of you will know, is a very, very valuable resource and can be recycled again and again. And that is used in the manufacture of beverage cans and car components. The coffee grounds are separated out and treated by anaerobic digestion to create biogas and soil improver. And even the collection bags can be recycled as well by a specialist um, plastic film reprocessor. Next slide, please, Catherine. So Podback have trialled some curbside collection in councils in England, and they're very keen to expand this into Northern Ireland. And we know a lot of the councils and some of our waste processes have expressed interest already. So we'd like to see expansion of this scheme. So the idea is then that the councils can add curbside collections of these pods um, to their collection services, but the pod manufacturers provide the funding through this pod back fund. So the whole process is cost neutral then. Any expense required, such as the vehicle modifications and communications are identified and then remuneration is agreed between the authority and pod back. And we've received communication from pod back that they can turn this around quite quickly. Um, also, by taking part in the scheme, the councils can show a commitment to really find solutions for some of these hard to recycle materials and would encourage councils to explore this if they could. So that's all from me. I'll hand back to Janice um, for the um, poll and final Q&A. Thank you. Next slide, Catherine. Thank you very much, Charmaine um, and Stephen as well. 
So this is our final poll today for you all to answer. Um, and, and we'd really like to know how having heard about Podback, is this something that you could use or recommend? Uh, very grateful if you would answer yes or no there. Um, and while you're thinking about that, just to recap that the last presentations have covered some potential changes for waste electricals and batteries through a statutory legislative system. And then we've also covered voluntary producer responsibility schemes, which are non statutory for chewing gum and coffee pods. So very different approaches and impacts. Um, also would like to, to say again that we're very pleased with the uptake from Northern Ireland Councils on the chewing gum fund and hope that we'll get a similar uptake for year two. So now back, back to you then, then, Amy, for the answers to the final poll. Yes, so we had um, 17 people saying that this definitely would be something they could use or recommend. Um, so lots of coffee drinkers or people in the industry on the call. Um, so yes, thank you. All right, thank you very much, Amy. Next slide, please, Catherine. Okay, uh, so this is our final section today, the Q&A session. We have about um, 10 minutes or so. Um, so again, we ask that you direct your question to all panelists through, through the Q&A function on the right-hand side of your screen. Uh, we're also ha ha happy to try and mop up any remaining questions that you have following the earlier sessions on EPR and DRS, if you have any. Um, so on this uh, Q&A panel, we have Aideen and Charmaine, they head up with two EPR teams in Dara, so that's the two heads of the teams. And we've also got Stephen, who, who just gave the talk there on waste electricals. Um, again, uh, during, the, during the presentations, we've been sorting through your questions and assigning them to different panel members. Um, so um, I can probably turn to each one in turn there and check uh, what can be answered. Um, so maybe turn to you, uh, Stephen, first. Is there anything there that you can take on we for us? Yeah, or actually, yeah, there's, <laughs> thanks, Janice. <laughs> actually, a couple of questions uh, uh, relating to vapes. I know that's grabbed the public attention uh, lately and a question about restricting their use. Um, there's no immediate plans uh, to introduce a ban on these things, uh, but the government is very concerned by the increase in use of these disposable vapes, especially in younger people and their improper disposal. So a range of options are being explored um, throughout the vaping sector to have a look at, to make sure they're fully compliant with the, re the wee regs. Uh, they do fall fall down as a wee product or under a wee product. Uh, we are going to look at that in the public consultation. That was another question. Are we going to look at that? That'll take part or go out in summer 2023 and very much that's going to be part of the work. I think it's 1.3 million of these are being thrown away every week. So this is not going unnoticed. Uh, we're going to look at things like the smoking cessation rates. Uh, it's one of the arguments for vapes, if you like, uh, but we have to weigh that up against the, the, the litter issue. Thank you, Stephen. And maybe turn to you next, Aideen. Have you anything there assigned to you? Sorry, I was just on mute there. Um, no, nothing just that I can see at the minute on batteries. There was a comment um, in relation to banning of disposable barbecues, and we can pass this on just to our waste prevention colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Yudin. Okay, then, Charmaine, anything assigned to you? Yeah, I have a few here. There's a lot of interest about littering as a general problem and fines. Um, as Stephen mentioned, yes, we have increased the fines that um, councils can levy to people from 80 to 200 pounds now. And of course, those fines will um, can be used against people who continue to drop gone. I have a few questions here on just the scope, I suppose, of the, the chewing gum. This is a limited scheme. This is not full EPR. This is a voluntary scheme and it'll run for five years with a view to making a fo more formal, um, taking a more formal look at EPR for gum in the future. But this voluntary scheme will run to this first five years. Um, and um, I have another one here. There's comments here just about the waste with coffee pods in general, you know, that it's a wasteful way to consume pods coffee and as I highlighted the consumption of these pods is now very very high and rising so um yes the, the fully recognize that um you know recycling these pods is not necessarily the the sole answer there's a problem with production of all this material in the first place but what I would say is um with the coffee pods as well there's um a question about where it's recycled 
Um, at cur currently, they can only be recycled in, in the UK, um, sorry, in mainland GB. So um, that's why there's the postback service as well. We don't currently have enough material here to have anything more local, um, but obviously all of those re resources and infrastructure needs are co constantly being looked at. I think that's about it on mine. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully that's answered those questions. Thank you, Charmaine. I'm just checking then. I think um, Stephen has a mop up question. Robert has at least one mop up question. And I'm not sure about Leslie. So maybe Stephen, if you could come in first, please. Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, a question here about prioritizing reuse over recycling. I sense they're heading towards the waste hierarchy there. Yeah, the prioritizing the reuse of we is actually embedded in the we regs. But we do accept more needs to be done to prioritize this much, much further. And indeed, this will also form a large part of the upcoming consultation. So as I mentioned in my PowerPoint, the current system was designed before the trend truly kicked in towards a, a circular economy. So the, the incentives aren't, aren't great. Uh, the careful handling of we at any point in the process should be done in a way that optimizes reuse, we believe. So our most preferred option is actually to prevent waste in the first place. And reuse does that, so it's right and proper that we reuse is prioritised over we recycling, and so the consultation will focus in on that. And we'd like to hear everyone's feedback ultimately to, to find solutions. Perfect, thank you. Maybe maybe you come in next, Robert. We're jumping about a bit, but hopefully we're helping people by answering these. Yeah, no, that's grand, Thomas. There's one in there. If DRS material and curbside collections are redeemed by the Council of Waste Management Company, will they need to be returned to the DMO uncompacted, intact, with the labels readable, or can these be be bailed? So, the the DRS containers will need to be readable. They need to be scanned. So whether that's done at a manual return point or through an RVM, but they will need to be able to be scanned. So uh, if the container's not intact and you can't read the label, the deposit can't be claimed back on it. So just to make that one clear. Thanks very much, Robert. And Leslie, you've got one too? Yes, yeah, so it's just a question in about will eco terms determine the liability for EPR fees in import scenarios? So if I could just ask whoever has written that, then just to send us a wee email outlining um, more specific details on it, because if you're importing products into in packaging, we may need you may as an organization need to take um some action under APR if you import the goods from outside the UK. So I just would like a little bit more more detail on that one. And again, there's a question over coffee cup recycling and scaling up recyclers in Northern Ireland. So that's similar to then the the coffee pods, you know, it's small at, at the moment, but as more people and organisations recycle, then that will be looked at. Thank you very much, Leslie. Um, just there's a couple of before I think Charmaine has more as well, but just before I do, there there's a, an old friend from packaging. I'll, I'll say that's who it is. It has put a very nice comment in um, about um, how beneficial this webinar is. So just to let that person know that yes, we can see your name and we know we who you are, and we really appreciate the feedback. Thank you very much. <laughs> I got a yay. Um, so then, just back over to you, Charmaine. Yes, just jumping back to packaging. I've had a question there about whether we'll look again at bringing in non-statutory bodies for EPR payments from bin waste, just to manage expectation there. We won't be anytime soon. You know, there's so much to do on bringing in packaging, EPR, and getting payments out to councils for street bin waste. That might not be the answer you want, but I'm just being very honest there of, of, of what that would be. Um, and also somebody else asking again about the Northern Ireland Protocol and the packaging packaging waste regulation. We're not going to be covering that today, but the department and all, all nations are looking at that very closely. Okay, thank, thank you. you. So just uh, I'll just check anyone shout out if they have any more questions. If not, I can move on. No silence. Very well done indeed. Then everyone, thank you very much. Um, so next slide then, please, Catherine. Our last slide. So okay, all that remains for me to say is thank you all very much for your attendance and your questions today, and we very much hope to see you again in future sessions. Also, thank you to the cast of panelists today for their presentations and I hope you find them very informative. And thanks again to Catherine for hosting us. 
Uh, we aim to host another webinar over the summer and of course we'll issue invites for this in due course. Um, and finally, to, to remind you that any questions that were unable to be answered today will be available on our website, along with the recording of today's event. We also have left on this slide our contact details. And if you have uh, any further questions, please just don't wait for the next webinar. Just um, get in touch with us and we'll, we'll do our best to help you. So um, thank you all very much for attending today. And that's goodbye from us tonight for now. Thank you.